Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Bench to Bedside webinar series. We're looking forward to an exciting webinar today. Um, before we get started with our uh, presentations today, I do want to go over some quick housekeeping with everybody to let you know that MitoMed 2024 is coming up in June, the 26th through the 29th, and that'll be in Cleveland, Ohio. And we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. You can go to umdfconference.org to learn more and register. We also wanted to remind everybody about MitoShare, our patient-populated registry. Uh, you can join at umdf.org, MitoShare-registry. This is for patients and clinicians alike, so you can go on um, and join MitoShare and also um, check in with some of your patients and um, anything in, in uh, MitoShare in the registry. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Kara to come on and introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Nicole, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, we're very excited to have three short presentations as part of the UMDF's commitment to furthering research. In 2023, at the last UMDF symposium, we debuted the opportunity for attendees to participate in clinical research at the UMDF annual conference. We called that the Research Pavilion. And so in 2023, more than 100 participated in the following studies that you will hear about today. And uh, we will get some updates on what these studies have achieved um, and what the outcomes of the research pavilion was in 2023. And if applicable, updates on what's going to happen in the 2024 symposium. So our first speaker today is Dr. Peter McGuire. He will talk to us about the study of viral exposures in children with mitochondrial disease for affected pediatric patients, which was conducted by the National Institute of Health. Peter, please share your slides and take it away. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Amel, for that introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about um, some of our findings uh, and, and an ongoing study we have. Um, which has to do with viral exposures uh, in children with mitochondrial disease. So as many of you may know, uh, my group uh, is very interested in infectious disease and mitochondrial disease. And we have an ongoing longitudinal natural history study known as the MINI study, which stands for Metabolism, Infection, and Immunity in Mitochondrial Disease. So this is a natural history study of viral infection and immunity in children specifically. Um, and we look at various things when we invite people to the NIH Clinical Center, which includes their infection history. Um, since uh, immune function is an important part of protecting individuals from viral infection, uh, we look at immune function. And then we also look at uh, any disability which may have resulted from um, their mitochondrial disease, as well as any viral infections they may have encountered. And on the team, on the clinical part of the team is myself. Um, uh, Dr. Eliza Gordon-Lipkin, who is our neurodevelopmental specialist, she's a child neurologist, as well as Shannon Kruk, who's our research nurse. Now, with regards to how we think about viral infection and mitochondrial disease, we use a conceptual framework, which is known as the Swiss cheese model, and this comes from uh, risk management, so this is kind of a barred concept. And so the concept is that each layer of Swiss cheese is a layer of defense, um, albeit imperfect, and that's reflected by the holes. Um, however, the multiple layers can kind of work together to help mitigate the effects of infection. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time basically um, defining vulnerabilities um, in children with mitochondrial disease and conducting mechanistic studies, um, which can help us design interventions, which uh, we can use to help uh, this vulnerable population. So we've done a number of home-based studies looking at viruses and viral exposures. We've looked at um, what we call risk mitigation behaviors, or in other words, um, behaviors that <clears throat> families with children with mitochondrial disease will engage in to avoid infection. Uh, we've looked at vaccination adherence. We've looked at various aspects of immune function, including B cells um, and titers to protect to vaccine preventable diseases. Um, and found that those are, have been lower, as well as uh, the antiviral repertoire. Um, that is actually less diverse, and there are lower levels of antiviral antibodies in the uh, mitochondrial disease population uh, in children. Um, we've looked at various aspects of immune function, including T memory function, which is important for vaccination as well as protection against viruses. 
Uh, we've also looked at cellular allostasis. So in other words, um, how cells with mitochondrial disease um, uh, react to stress and that stress being viral infection or immune activation. Um, and then we've also looked at various aspects of inflammation. Inflammation is very toxic uh, to cells infected by mitochondrial disease. And not only are the cells kind of inherently um, um, susceptible to dysfunction because of cytokines or inflammation, but individuals with mitochondrial disease in general actually have increased inflammatory tone to begin with. So when we talk about viral infection, I think the, the, the picture that people kind of normally think of is um, the viruses that we're exposed to throughout the year. Um, so this is a, a picture of the seasonality of viral infections where you can see influenza begins around the October, November time period and persists um, till about now, till April. Um, it does exist all year round, but these are kind of um, uh, the season of heightened activity. Um, so respiratory viruses, which are all listed on here, are um, those exposures happen in a number of different ways. Um, and these are ones that as, as clinicians um, are really familiar with, and this is how we advise our patients in terms of uh, helping to mitigate um, their exposure to infections. So respiratory viral infections not only can be you know, passed by droplet or aerosolization um, via short range transmission or long range transmission, but there are also things like direct contact um, involving sharing things like utensils or um, uh, um, things where people can actually have direct contact with viruses and also fomites. So in other words, inanimate objects like cell phones and things like that, which can also be responsible for passing viruses. Um, but one of the things I think that people um, uh, tend to forget about or don't really want to think about is that viruses are, are basically, we are being exposed to viruses on a daily basis. Um, so, and our immune system is designed to help protect us against that. Um, this was a study that was actually published, uh, um, two studies, one of which was published in 2021 um, by a group at the University of Iowa looking at um, aerosol concentration um, from, from toilet flushing. Um, so this is not exactly happy lunchtime conversation, but this is the reality that we live in where, you know, they, they wound up using a murine norovirus. So in other words, non-infectious to humans, but they use it as their test organism to look to see how much spread you would get with the flushing of toilets. So um, this can actually be a significant uh, exposure um, to various types of viruses. This was actually followed up by a study in 2024 where they looked at whether opening or closing the lid um, actually had any effect. And as it turns out, um, it does not have an effect. So closing the lid doesn't actually protect against this aerosolization of virus and this exposure. Um, the, the proper cleaning of the area um, is actually more effective. So how do we think about viruses and children with mitochondrial disease? Well, there are a couple of background you know, um, pieces of information that I want to let you know about. So up to 80% of children with mitochondrial disease experience recurrent infections. And most of these infections are respiratory. And this is something we published a couple of years ago. They may cause metabolic decompensation. So in other words, a deterioration um, in, their, in uh, the patient's clinical status. And intercurrent infection is actually a leading cause of episodic neuro neurodegeneration in children with mitochondrial disease. Um, so here on the right, you can see there's a figure which is kind of a schematized version of neurodevelopment. And this was something that was developed by Eliza Gordon-Lipkin in our group, um, where you have normal development, but in children with mitochondrial disease, they can normally um, experience regression, but in here we're pointing out episodes of metabolic decompensation and stepwise decline in age-appropriate skills due to viral infection. So these systemic perturbations can actually exacerbate disease progression. And because of this, families are very aware of this and they engage in what are called risk mitigation behaviors. So uh, about a couple of years ago, we, we did this study during COVID-19 because everyone was being advised at that time um, to engage in these risk mitigation behaviors. And so that means essentially non-pharmacologic interventions for the avoidance of infectious exposure. So that was broken down to things like hygiene and shopping practices and social practices. And in general, the takeaway message is that our patients and our families 
are really highly adherent to these risk mitigation behaviors, engaging in about 10 to 15 different risk mitigation behaviors to help prevent infection. And we believe that this actually persists outside of COVID-19 because the risk that is posed to children with mitochondrial disease. So in, in the, during the pandemic, we conducted a study to look at viral exposures um, in children with mitochondrial diseases in households. Um, and we used uh, a number of platforms to look at COVID-19 exposure, um, as well as exposure to other viruses. And what we found is that these are spoke diagrams here on the right, and uh, red is positive uh, and green is negative. And this is for COVID-19 specifically. And the way that the spoke diagrams are arranged is that the person who is at risk, which is the child with mitochondrial disease, is in the middle of the spoke, and then it radiates out to other members of the household. And you can see basically that of the 20 families that we studied, nearly everyone um, was exposed to, um, to COVID-19. So COVID-19 was quite prevalent in this population. What about other viral exposures? So during this 2020-21 season, um, despite these risk mitigation behaviors and how really good the families are with hand washing, social distancing, et cetera, they were still exposed to a significant number of viruses, including things like rhinovirus and various enteroviruses. Um, so this was a study of 15 households with 17 children with mitochondrial disease. There were more than 38 respiratory and GI viruses that the families actually encountered. And this resulted in, and, and when you average it out per child, it's about five viral infections per year that they're actually exposed to. This resulted in 34 episodes of documented clinical illness um, and six hospitalizations from which five patients actually had exacerbation of their underlying neurologic symptoms. So as the study is continuing, there are a number of questions that still need to be answered. So I'm gonna wrap up with that. So basically we want to know what is the yearly variation. So this is an ongoing study. What's the yearly variation in the viral exposome um, in children with mitochondrial disease, specifically Lee syndrome is one of the syndromes we study, um, but we study all different um, uh, um, types of mitochondrial disease in children. And specifically, we wanna know which viruses are associated with an exacerbation or development of CNS disease. In our previous study, we did two time points, the beginning of the year and the end of the year, so 2020 to 2021. So we wanna get more granular. We wanna track the episodes of illness to see what viruses may have been associated with either hospitalization or exacerbation of neurologic symptoms. And to do this, we use a platform called VIRSCAN, which is a genomics platform where we can do either at the NIH Clinical Center or in a more powerful way in the home where we can take capillary blood samples and this method's been validated. We can actually extract antibodies, so antiviral antibodies from uh, the individual and this is then used to probe a phage display library, which contains the entire uh, proteins from the entire human viral exposome. Um, then we sequence the, 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 the antibodies that bind or then uh, the phages are then isolated. Then we can sequence the phages and figure out what viruses an individual has been exposed to at that time. So with more frequent sampling, we can actually then tie it into um, actual episodes of metabolic decompensation and decline. So in summary, viral infection, despite the engagement in these risk mitigation behaviors, still remains a major threat to children with, with mitochondrial disease, can cause metabolic decompensation, CNS decline, progression of their disease. And so therefore, understanding these viral exposures and clinical outcomes um, will help improve patient care. Um, so basically, um, we would like to see more families, we like to recruit more families, and look at um, the viral exposures in those families. And this is a QR code um, to access information about our studies. And lastly, I'd like to thank the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation for their continuing support, of course, and all of our collaborators um, who have sent us patients and remain uh, very important in our efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, would you share with the audience whether you'll be at the research pavilion this year as well? Yes. So actually, we're conducting, con conduct, excuse me, conducting our study at the research pavilion. So we're going to bring kits with us, which allow for the capillary blood sampling. It's like you know, individuals checking their blood sugar, um, and those kits can either be brought home, and they will they will be provided with mailing 
uh, materials to send it back to us, or they can just leave it with us at the conference and we will bring it back to NIH. Okay, so both patients who have already enrolled in your study can come back for a second exactly. round and new exactly. ones who would like to, to participate can also come in. Okay, um, so we don't have any questions for you in the Q&A, but if you do have any questions for Dr. Peter Maguire, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get back to them at the end of the, um, of the talks. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank Our you. next speaker, sorry, is uh, Dr. Zuela Zolkipli Cunningham, and she's going to give us an update on her study, Motor Skills Assessment of Mitochondrial Disease Patients, which was conducted by the research team at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Zuela, please um, take it away. Thanks so much, Amal. Everybody see my slides okay? Sounds like uh, yes. you can. Oh, yes, we okay. do. Yeah, thank you. Great. So um, first, I'd like to mention that the work at the UMDF Pavilion last year was supported by the UMDF. Um, so I'll start off with the background. We primarily study and capture, sorry, quantify um, symptoms of mitochondrial myopathy in my research group. And so the um, definition of mitomopathy for the audience, since this is a learning um, seminar, one needs to have genetic confirmation of primary mitochondrial disease, mitochondrial myopathy being a subset of primary mitochondrial disease. Patients are not exclusively with myopathy problems, but they have to have predominant symptoms of myopathy, which can be either or muscle weakness, cramps, exercise intolerance, muscle fatigue, and ideally, if possible, biochemical evidence of mitochondrial oxfos deficiency. And so what we've um, been able to establish in my group is the MMCOS, the Mitochondrial Myopathy Composite Assessment Tool, and so this is validated now um, in children and adults, and it's um, uh, something that requires uh, great precision, and so requires somebody with a neuromuscular expertise in the assessments in all of these five domains. Um, that is strength, muscle fatigue, balance, exercise intolerance, and dexterity. So what we did before we um, embarked on the um, um, systemic uh, process of validating this tool that we devised, uh, was the need to understand from our patients what they considered was particularly problematic and burdensome. And so we came up with these five domains. So this is very much uh, the patient voice. The assessments that are conducted by Jean, who is the co-inventor of this MM course alongside myself, is uh, assessments that are already out there. There's normative data out there. And so what we did was assess what could be conducted by our patients and therefore then put it together in a specific order because of course the sequence of assessments was really important to avoid fatigue. Um, um, it's very feasible across the age spectrum from five years and above and non-ambulatory patients can be assessed. And so what we do then is we are able to present the data as Z-scores using the normative data that I mentioned. And this is really the slide that opens up to my talk today. So if you see the multiple boxes here, what's really quite uh, profound is that our patients have abnormalities you see in all the multiple domains. So the Z-score is presented as minus two and below being abnormal. And so you'll see that most of the patients mean Z-score. And this was um, among a large cohort. We've um, now assessed uh, 200 people. So um, these are the baseline assessments. The uh, muscle strength is minus two and below across the, mus the multiple muscle groups that are mentioned there. We have proximal and distal, by the way, because we've now been able to establish that patients also have distal weakness in, in alignment with their uh, proximal muscle weakness. Uh, there's muscle fatigue, there's uh, balance problems, there's exercise intolerance problems, and there's dexterity problems. So we're able to quantify all of that. Um, and this really does, this slide really just tells the story of our patient's burden. Um, they are um, symptomatic across all of these age spectrums, the, the, sorry, across all of these domains. The patients uh, may differ based on their ages. So some children may have more weakness um, than the adults and the adults may have more muscle fatigue. But overall, you can see that there is a significant burden because the Z-score is minus two and below uh, across all of the domains, um, across the whole patient cohort. We can present the data as a mean composite score, which you see up there. So it's a raw score of above one for the patients compared to patients without genetically confirmed. That's the unlikely group. And now we have data on control group, which is minus 0 0.5. So really it's a very large difference between controls and uh, definite mito patients. So that's the background that set us up for doing this study at the UMDF last year. The hypothesis or the research question was, would digital assessments enhance our clinical assessments? So we've been able to 
quantify with precision their symptoms, but would digital assessments actually make our clinical assessments better? So that, that was the question. So we had the opportunity to collaborate with two companies. One is Protokinetics, which is a spinoff from the Gate, right, which some of you might be familiar with. So it's a, a Gate mat that you see in this photo here. Um, it assesses uh, different characteristics characteristics of GAIT. It is um, uh, something that is uh, very user-friendly, very, very um, uh, easy to roll out on the floor and get your patients to walk over it. And so we teamed this up with the M Health Technologies, which is wearable sensors. So this is now digital devices that you can wear and walk about in the community or at home. Um, and we focused on the M sway, which is a measure essentially of balance. And it's worn as this belt that is shown here. And then digitally you get um, you know, this this drawing of how your patients or volunteers uh, are able to stand uh, in a in one position or are swaying over when they're walking. So what we did at the um, conference was um, we had this um, mat rolled out in the uh, six minute walk test area. And we were fortunate last year to have a big ballroom. So we had two mats rolled out with people um, um, being tested in parallel. So there, there was a lot of productivity. We managed to assess 60 plus people last year. It was uh, tremendously um, well received and we, we really appreciated people who came forward, patients, families, and researchers and scientists. So that was really terrific. I'm just gonna go back to the slide to say the gate ride assessment has been conducted and published by two groups in the past. And of course, you know, we, we reviewed this data to see how helpful it would be to perform the assessments again but somehow do it in a very different way so that we're able to show that there is clinical meaning in our particular cohort. So the um, Nijmegen group found that there was indeed differences in all of the uh, step and strength measurements, stride measurements, sorry, that were uh, conducted using the gate ride, gate ride. And this was in patients with mitral disease compared to controls. Uh, in the Newcastle group in this uh, paper in 2014, they were able to compare it to the Newcastle scale uh, to show that there was a higher disease uh, clinical disease burden as measured by the uh, NAMDAS compared to um, the step and stride uh, measurements obtained. So really very useful to have these prior publications. So what we did at the assessment at the conference was we focused on conducting our MMCOS assessments and then having the same subjects perform these digital assessments. Um, and then what we have here is just to show that we roughly had um, same number of people in the three groups. So we decided to divide it up by those with genetic confirmation. So there were some individuals who attended the conference with their a laboratory confirmation of the genetic uh, diagnosis, or they, and Nicole will explain this later, they were able to upload this prior to um, uh, coming to the conference when they signed up for these assessments. So there were genetically confirmed patients. There were patients who were self-reported as having primary mitral disease, and that's uh, shown as SR, PMD, and then there were healthy volunteers. And what you'll see here is just fascinating. Even, even just you know, one uh, shot of assessments over uh, two and a half days last year gave us ample data um, that I'm going to show you now. So what you're seeing here is the data presented as uh, color-coded. So blue is the healthy volunteers compared to green for those with genetic confirmation of mito disease, and then those in orange were the self-reported. And there's two aspects of the analysis, the whether the groups were different in their data, and then what the data was like over time in each of the individual groups. So first of all, what you'll see here is the um, width, so the distance between the feet as where uh, individuals are walking versus the uh, stride length. Um, and so what we can see here is that our patients with primary mitral disease in green certainly stand with their feet further apart. Um, and that is consistent over time compared to healthy volunteers who are not as uh, wide apart. And then in terms of uh, stride, the patients are certainly taking shorter strides compared to the controls. This is very expected and shown in those other publications. It goes along with our six minute walk test data, it makes sense in terms of the strike length, why our patients are walking a smaller distance. But then we looked at other parameters that we're able to get from the, the um, um, sorry, not the gate, right? But the Xenomat. So this is um, a newer company and the mat is now called Xenomat. So their stride velocity were indeed much slower, sorry, compared to, oh, I'm sorry compared to uh, the healthy volunteers in blue. Uh, again, the cadence, so the number of steps per minute was also slower. So again, this makes sense when you understand that the total distance walk in the six minutes in our patients is much slower. 
but also we get more data out of the gait assessment. So now we're going into um, aspects that inform us of their balance. So how balanced they are in terms of walking. And so you can see here very clearly that the patients um, are in fact uh, um, preferring to not have just one foot on the ground uh, when they're walking. And in fact, that gets worse over time um, and the opposite. Um, uh, where patients are um, spending less time with um, both feet up in the air. So it really is uh, a matter of um, how stable an individual is when they're walking. And this is not really reflected in the total distance walk that we all very typically measure in the six minutes. And these two parameters are also indicative of balance. Um, and you'll see here a very big difference between the uh, controls in blue and the patients in green, and that there is a change over time indeed, and then that this is significantly different between the controls and the patients. So this is a lot of data we generated. What was good to know was that A, it was feasible, B, it was um, uh, pretty easy to perform because we're already doing the six minute walk test. Um, and then actually it was really gratifying to see that even in small number of patients, only 19, you'll see that the uh, parameters were all statistically significantly different in the patients compared to the controls. Uh, every single parameter that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of how fast they walk, in terms of how wide apart their feet are, in terms of their balance. But the most important thing there was to show what it meant to show that these parameters are actually useful to measure in our patients as opposed to just being able to measure it, right? So this is why it was important that we conducted the MM Coast assessments. Um, um, so therefore, you know, the assessments were quite long. It took about an hour per individual um, last year at the UMDF, but it was uh, far more beneficial doing it this way because really this just one table tells you that the significance of measuring the um, uh, the uh, Xenomat uh, data is really very useful. So um, I'll just quickly summarize it by saying most of the parameters were uh, correlating to our clinical balance assessments. They were all correlating to our six minute walk test score that gene measures in terms of distance and then expresses as a Z score. And they mostly all correlated to our MM Coast composite score. This is really strong data comparing, you know, considering there was only 19 individuals, it turns out that an assessment of gait is really very closely reflective and correlating to our MM Coast composite score, which as you, as I showed earlier, is an overall score of multiple domains. So this is really very encouraging results to be seeing in our first cohort um, and the first time we're doing these assessments. We see, we see the same strong correlations in the self-reported uh, mito disease patients too. So really just in the last five minutes, I'm just gonna show you the MSWAY data because this is really quite unique where some of you might have seen prior gait analysis data. This is really quite cool. So what we did was we teamed up the MSWAY. Um, you'll see here balance assessments uh, along the gait mat. So um, and then what was um, the data that I'm gonna show you is in fact the MSWAY that we measured while the, the 30 second sit to stand was being performed, uh, which in fact was done over 60 seconds at the conference. And so this was a slightly smaller cohort because it added on time and we only had one of the um, sensor kits last year. We're hoping to have more this year. Uh, so there were only seven genetically confirmed um, and then approximately 20 of the self-reported and the control individuals. And I think this graph really just tells it all. So again, when you measure a 30 or 60 second sit to stand, the physical therapist is calculating the number of times that you are able to stand up from a sitting position and that you're able to fully stand up depending on the protocol. So what we're not able to do from the clinical assessments is to quantify the uh, quality of standing up, right? Whether somebody is doing it really well or whether they're actually standing up and a little bit sway. So what you see here is just in the graph um, uh, alone, you're able to see that the mitochondrial disease patient sways a lot more uh, over a wider area um, as in the anteroposterior position as compared to an individual who is healthy. So this is really cool stuff. Um, so this is really nice stuff that we're not able to quantify again in our clinical assessments. Let me just walk you through a couple more slides to see that the data tells us that we need to continue to do these um, assessments because uh, in more patients, because it might actually give us a lot more than we're getting currently with our clinical assessments. So 
uh, first graph to say that this is uh, you measure the range of acceleration uh, while you're sitting while you're sitting and then standing up. So controls tend to accelerate in the vertical um, uh, vertically more quicker than patients with mito disease. Uh, the controls tend to rotate to much better. They handle the rotation um, faster than mito patients during the sit to stand movement. So again, this is all about the quality of um, standing up from a sitting position. Uh, controls seem to have motor planning better than mito patients based on an assessment of what's called the jerk, uh, where patients um, have a lower jerk compared to the controls. And then we also were able to display the data over time, which was really very nice, because again, we're doing 30 second or 60 second um, capture of assessments. So what we're doing here is we're conducting the same assessments I showed you earlier for the uh, Xenomat. And here you can see in blue, the controls compared to the uh, self-reported um, in orange and the mito patients are really quite far apart in terms of, um, uh, and this is statistically significant, for the self-reported group to controls for the uh, range of vertical acceleration and also for the jerk. So clearly this is really very useful stuff to measure and there's a lot more parameters just showing you all of this that I don't still quite understand yet, but we're really um, hoping to conduct more of these assessments this year. So again, uh, not good enough to just be able to measure the assessments. We need to understand that it really correlates with the clinical information that we have. And you'll see here that indeed, you know, what we're measuring in jerk indeed correlates with our clinical assessments of the 30 seconds state to stand. And even in these small number of patients, early data showing that it's correlating to our composite score. So really quite incredible to be able to have this amount of data from one year, of, um, two and a half days of assessment. So in conclusion, we have this validated mitomathy outcome measure called the MMCOS that now provides a platform to validate newer methods. The gait analysis is indeed clinically meaningful based on our preliminary data, correlates strongly with the MMCO scores and captures de de or defects or impairments beyond our clinical assessments. The balance assessment also detects abnormalities, sorry, this is with the MSWAY sensor. It detects abnormalities that are not typically quantified on clinical assessments. You saw earlier that the 30 second count is really very different to the quality that is being able to capture it by being able to be captured by the uh, MSWAY sensor. So overall, therefore, we conclude that per, uh, based on the preliminary data, the digital assessment indeed enhances even the most robust of clinical assessments. It's really important to mention that partnership between all of us, researchers, industry, family, patients, is very, very important. Uh, thank you so much to the participants last year. We're really very excited to the re be returning to the pavilion this year. We're going bigger. Uh, we're doing the same assessments, except we're adding on a third um, device. This one is an insole. It measures gait too, but it is an insole that it gets inserted into your shoe and therefore is um, targeting um, remote assessments. So when the patients are at home, we're bringing a larger team. We have three vendors. And also we're going to be joined by our um, CHOP Department of Defense Studies that is uh, developing new methods to measure mitochondrial function. So we're going to be collecting breath and pupillometry assessments at the pavilion this year too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you as well, that was amazing. Um, I uh, saw all the patients going back and forth to that ballroom room last year, and I was uh, very uh, wondering what was going on in there. Um, so this is great um, data, and I'm glad that you're coming back next year. Um, there are no questions in the Q&A, so we'll move on to our third and last presentation. Um, this is going to be given by Amber Saf uh, from EMS, and she's going to tell us about the video assessment for primary mitochondrial myopathy and pole gamma disease patients, which was conducted by the research firm EMS in uh, collaboration with uh, also formerly known as Casimir in collaboration with the Pole Gamma Foundation uh, and uh, UMDF. Amber? Thank you. Can you all see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Amber Sapp. I am a physical therapist by background. Um, and with MSA, I work as the neuromuscular solution lead. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about the mitochondrial video assessment um, pilot study that we did last year. So really, it has to start with um, this background that we have with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, in addition to being a physical therapist, I'm a mom of a son with Duchenne. That's him and his dog in the picture. Um, but that's kind of how we, we started on this journey. 
um, we really noticed that there was a disconnect between how families and patients mark meaningful disease progression or decline and how it's been measured in a clinic. Um, so the, the solution that we came up with um, is a really a new approach to determine how Duchenne progressed. And we do that by quantifying the ease of movement. And we found out that that is really um, less subject to motivational factors um, as some of the clinical assessments can be. It seems to be more meaningful to patients and families. And it allows us to assess a patient's habitual way of performing tasks. So rather than um, performing a, a clinical assessment in a coached manner, um, like try climbing these stairs, um, try and do it without using the handrail or try and do it without leading with the same foot. Um, we really want to see how a patient moves in their own home environment. So with the Duchenne video assessment, as well as our other video assessment tools, um, it's an at-home capture. Um, to, we really want to capture participants in their natural environment. Um, and we really want it to be tasks that are meaningful to patients and families. So we did a lot of um, interviews with patients, families, KOLs in the space, to determine what's, what is and what isn't considered meaningful. Um, you know, do boys with Duchenne care about how far they can walk in six minutes? No, they don't. They just care about things like, can I walk across the lunchroom without falling? Or can I still get myself to the bathroom on my own? I mean, it's really data that can't be captured in a clinic. Some of the tasks include things um, like getting off your own sofa. Uh, we repeat that task over time to see how that specific movement changes. And what's really key here, and I think what's really applicable to the mitochondrial community, is that it also helps to decrease travel and clinic fatigue um, that's often associated with clinical trials. Um, I know my own son has been a part of several trials where we would be asked to fly across the country, get up the next morning in a new time zone, um, where he has fasting blood work and then immediately goes to physical therapy assessments where um, you know, he's maybe too cranky or too tired to perform them. Um, maybe he doesn't like the assessor. Um, and so it really impacts be behavior and performance in a clinical setting. So this is just a quick uh, rundown. These are the tasks that we used in our Duchenne video assessment. And these, again, were, were built by patients, families, physical therapists in the space, and other KOLs. I won't go into each one of those because the tasks really vary depending on um, the disease population that we're looking at. So how it really works is that caregivers or patients, um, depending on the age, will receive a video capture manual that describes exactly how to take the tasks at home. They're also asked to watch um, training videos in order to open up the capture window within the app. Um, they, have to, um, they have to have watched these videos to make sure they know how to do that or else the uh, window won't open within the app. And it's nice because it gives sort of, you know, more than one uh, way to learn. So if you if you learn better by reading, maybe the capture manual is key for you versus watching a video on how to how to capture. Um, they'll record the same uh, tasks every day or the everyday movement tasks, sorry, in the same um, standardized way at home. So if they've captured um, on a hardwood floor for the walking task. Um, each time they capture that, they make sure they capture on the same type of flooring or the same type of sofa or whatever the same tools that they use for that task. We have some quality um, control folks in our in-house that will watch these videos, make sure they meet quality parameters. And if they don't, they get sent back for a reshoot. And then at the end of a study, we have um, centralized scoring that happens with certified physical therapists who can be blinded to the time point and the treatment arm if it's um, a study in that case. I'm gonna show you guys an example of what this looks like. This is obviously a boy of Duchenne. I don't have access to share any of the videos that we captured um, for our pilot study for the mitochondrial group, but um, this gives you a pretty good idea of what to expect. So on the left, you'll see a video. The task is stand up from sitting on the floor. And on the right is an example of our scorecard. And so you can see the things that we're looking for are qualitative movements. Um, what we're not looking for is how quickly he does it. Um, we just wanna take a look at how he's, how he's performing it. So we're looking at things like, um, does he have to use, uh, does he get on all fours to stand up? Um, are his feet wider than his base of support? Uh, like wider than his shoulder width base of support? Um, does he use a gower sign to stand up? Is he pushing off of his thighs? 
So as we're kind of assessing those, we can we can add these up on our compensatory scorecard that he has two out of the eight pre-identified compensations for this task. Now, if we compare that to um, some of the standard measures that are used in Duchenne in a clinical setting, um, North Star assessment is North Star ambulatory assessment is a pretty common one. Um, he would be scored a one on that assessment. Um, and so um, what's sort of key with North Star is it's a three point scale. Those are pretty common um, in clinical trials. Um, it's either a zero, they can't perform it. One, they are compensated in some way or two, they're uncompensated. So a typical performance. I mean, he would be one because he demonstrates some level of compensation. So if we take a look at the same patient 30 weeks later, play it again. He's still a North Star score of one because he's still compensated in his movement. However, we can quantify the changes that we see. Um, and I think even without a scorecard, um, a person could look at this and determine that he seems uh, more impaired than he was on that uh, baseline time point. But the things that are changing are that his base of support has gotten wider. Um, he's pushing off of his thighs now with his hand. Um, so he has five of the eight compensations where he had two before. So this just gives you an idea of um, what our video assessments could look like. Um, and all of these things have been validated. I'm happy to share these manuscripts with you all if you're interested. Um, things from the capture procedures have been validated um, all the way through um, the task selection um, and the concept of interest, which is ease of movement. So a little bit about um, the mitochondrial video assessment that we piloted last year at the UMDF annual conference. Um, really the challenge in this community was more about um, identifying tasks that can be visibly compensated on a video. So a lot of the folks that we interviewed described um, feeling fatigued during certain tasks. So they had eye fatigue during reading, for example, but that's really difficult to capture on video. So um, this is the list of tasks that we eventually settled on um, with input from Pulgy families, PMM families, and KOLs in the space. So we're looking at things like sitting up from lying in bed, shampooing hair, taking a shirt off and on, cutting and eating food, drinking water, lifting a gallon container. I believe we lifted that from the floor onto a counter and then again um, up into a cabinet, um, walking, um, standing from sitting on the floor, reaching for a cell phone, standing up from a chair and climbing five stairs. We also included a um, participant choice that was optional. So if there was something um, an individual was particularly interested in capturing on video, then we had them um, capture that as well. You know, some of the reasons that we selected these as opposed to some of the other tasks, um, you know, six minute walk has been mentioned already once. Um, when we interviewed families, it was interesting because they described um, not the inability to do tasks like a six minute walk, but the recovery time that was associated with doing a task like that. They felt like their um, ability to perform that task was not necessarily impaired and didn't necessarily show in the results. Just the fact that the, the next day they were um, unable to get out of bed or unable to go to work because of the fatigue that was um, still associated with that task from the day before. Uh, really, so the purpose of the study that we initiated last summer was to adapt the scorecards that we started developing for Duchenne um, to the mitochondrial population. And we did a little bit of initial work with MGH to start development of these scorecards with a really small population. And so going into the study, the pilot study last year, we already had some um, adaptations we knew we were gonna have to make. So things like walking. So in Duchenne, we asked patients to walk um, 30 feet and we filmed that and we take a look at how they compensate to maintain their independence at the skill. However, we weren't noticing those same compensations in the mitochondrial population. So instead what we were noticing were some other things that um, as Boyla described earlier, things like ataxia and balance deficits. And so those are the things that we decided would make more sense to measure for this scorecard. Um, some other things we adapted um, right off the bat were the getting off the couch. We allowed participants to use a walker or some sort of aid. Um, and we didn't see that in some of the other populations we looked up. 
So at the in-person family conference, we captured initial video data on seven participants. And then those same seven also captured video at home. Um, two weeks later, they did an AM and a PM capture. Really, that was just our efforts to kind of invoke this, you know, what I described as a fatigue factor. Like, how does that change? How does the performance on the same task change if you're doing it in the morning versus if you're doing it in the afternoon? Um, they also did the task one week later in the morning. So in total, we ended up with 10 full G participants and 19 with primary mitochondrial disease. After each of these captures, we also did some qualitative questions. Um, each of them answered, how would you rate the difficulty or the degree of difficulty you experienced in completing the activities, um, ranging from very easy to very difficult? And then what aspects of your life have had an influence on how hard it is to use your arms, legs, and or body? So things like illness or stress. And we capture these at each time point. So really the next steps um, to kind of continue with this mitochondrial video assessment tool is to do the scorecard adaptation. Um, so we have all these videos captured. Um, but, you know, the idea would be to go in and take a look at those and see how do those compare with the scorecards we built for Duchenne, for example. We've also done this in a couple of other um, rare disease populations and just modified scorecards to be really specific to that population. Um, we then develop a rater training and certification program for physical therapists. Um, that's, that we ask that they repeat that every single year um, just to make sure that they, they know exactly what they're scoring. It involves some really detailed video examples of each criteria they should look at. Um, and then it involves like a, a post test where they have to maintain a certain percentage in order to consider um, being certified. And then we would take that, those adapted scorecards and score those original videos that we captured starting in the, the, um, the family conference last year. And then we would um, analyze the data. So um, yeah, I think that's all I have for slides. Um, I just wanna thank every, um, everyone who participated um, as well as the UMDF, the Polgy Foundation. Um, this is a really collaborative effort and um, we're excited to see what next steps are. Thank you, Amber. Um, do you have a sense of when we can get um, a first look at the data that was collected? Um, so we are having conversations now with some groups to help fund that next phase of the work. Um, that's always kind of the the rate limiting factor is funding to do all those next steps. So I know that that's, I know that's in the works. Um, I, I don't know what a timeline is for that though. Okay. Um, I just wanted to emphasize two things about this study. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank the Paul Gamma Foundation, which was the catalyst for this um, study. And I would like to thank the UMDF and the Mito Foundation from Australia. They all three advocacy group worked together to fund this uh, pilot study. And um, that was great to see them all collaborate together. I also wanted to emphasize that um, it, it, it's harder to enroll patients as well as you are lucky to have 60 people in your pavilion. Um, but for the study, it was much harder because the criteria were much stricter. So I would like to really put a call out there for any patients or caregivers um, listening in that we really need you to participate in these studies because that's how we gather data. That's how we validate new outcome measures to help us better monitor you, better treat you and get to those cures and the cl and, and clinical trial um, uh, successes. And with that, we do have one question. Um, can you, Amber, please speak to the regulatory bodies, FDA or EMA, regarding acceptance or critiques of these outcome measures that you're trying to develop? And maybe after you're done, Zuela, you can also comment a little bit on that for your own studies. Sure. Um, several years back, we we FDA actually kind of prompted us to create this tool um, as a they. FDA apparently receives a lot of um, video, you know, what they call evidence, um, but maybe not be validated evidence. So videos that are submitted without any sort of, you know, um, regulation surrounding them. So we wanted to really make sure that this was um, a validate, validated assessment. And we've had a lot of conversations with FDA to make sure we're kind of following those guidelines. Um, and several years back, we were accepted into their qualification program. 
um, to develop the Duchenne video assessment to be a qualified endpoint for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, and actually in January, we submitted our full qualification plan to FDA, and we should hear sometime very soon if it's been accepted. Um, even if it's not been accepted, the things that we might see some, um, just some questions they may have about specific statistical analyses they'd like to see, but otherwise they've been very um, positive and supportive of the tool. Um, so what was the other question? Oh, EMA. We've not submitted to EMA. We've had a lot of conversations. Um, it's a bit cross cost prohibitive at this point, but um, I, I think in general, the FDA, FDA has been very supportive of video assessments that are standardized and regulated and have audit trails and things like that. Yeah, that's, okay. that's before really you point. answer, sorry, go ahead, Zuela. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say that that was really helpful to hear, Amber. It's a, a great question you asked, Brian. So I, I have to say we we're working on this um, this MM Coast, and we actually have several outcome measures spinoff um, from the original UMDF grant that was awarded to me in 2016. So we've been working on this a number of years. Throughout that time, we continue to have discussions with the FDA, uh, more along the lines of, are we along the right lines? You know, is this something that uh, you foresee as being um, uh, helpful and meaningful in the clinical trial? They gave us um, tips on uh, what they would be expecting to see. Um, we have data on uh, how the patients are impacted, in fact, by myopathy. That's currently in a paper draft that um, is about to be submitted. So we definitely learn a lot about what their expectations would be. My own personal experience from an academic institution, so slightly different to Amber, is that um, they to hear the... You're, you're breaking up, Suela. So I'm co deaf with uh, multiple assessments with the FDA. We have not, you know, that like Amber mentioned, the for the EMA. So I don't know if everyone got that because you broke up several times during oh, that sorry. answer. Um, can you just repeat the last two sentences? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Sorry. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Just I'll, yes. I'll speak loud. <laughs> okay, I'll speak loud. Um, we definitely... We definitely had discussions with the FDA on making sure the MM Coast and our other outcome measures are something that is um, going to be able to be used in a clinical trial. The answer was yes, they were very supportive. Uh, we haven't submitted anything formally, as Amber mentioned, but we've definitely had um, understanding that if we publish and show strong data, that it would be widely accepted. So that, that's the extent of the MM Coast. We actually have um, two, three more um, um, other outcome measures that we're in the process of publishing. Um, and then we hope to be able to publish it alongside this wearables. So pretty much, in fact, once we complete our assessments at this year's conference, if we get the same number of participants, we hope patients, families, volunteers, please come, then we'll be able to submit a strong paper if the data is as strong as it is now. Very good. Thank you. And Peter, I would like to invite you to join us um, as well, because we finished with uh, the three presentation and it's time for questions. We do have one question for Amber. Um, thank you, Amber, for the presentation. Did you formally assess patients' family experience of next day fatigue after participation versus example what they've anecdotally reported for the six minute walk test? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the two questions that we asked um, I can pull them back up. Um, just gathering, you know, qualitatively, you know, what was prohibitive and don't exactly what they are. Um, just around the difficulty after the um, activities, as well as the influence, um, whatever was going on in their lives. So I haven't taken a look at that data myself, but those questions were asked after each um, video capture, whether it was um, at the conference or at home. So I think that we, we should have something really important to glean from those answers. Okay, thank you. And Peter, question for you. The total number of annual infections does not seem dramatically different from what would be expected in the general young pediatric population. Is that correct? Yeah. So the issue is not so much um, getting infections more often. It's just that the, the actual stress of the infection is something that um, children with mitochondrial disease cannot tolerate. Um, and that not only relates to on a whole body level, but also on their individual cells with regards to, 
you know, inflammation and immune activation. So while the frequency is not increased, um, their, their reaction to it is obviously very, very different than, than um, individuals who do not have mitochondrial disease. And Peter, one question from me. Um, you've been doing this for many years now. Do you have enough data, robust data at this point to come up with some specific clinical recommendations for patient, pediatric patients with mitochondrial disease in terms of specific uh, guidelines in terms of vaccination or uh, preventative measures to avoid getting sick or what to do if you get sick with certain viruses? Yeah, so, so far what we've talked about in some of our publications really has to do with vaccination and adherence to the vaccination schedule. Um, in general, from our studies, we've found that there, there is a concern amongst the mitochondrial disease community. We've documented that concern mm -hmm. um, of some individuals having adverse events with vaccination. Um, so while we've documented the concern, we have not seen um, as an overall trend in the mitochondrial disease population that individuals do not fare well after vaccination. Actually, they tolerate it quite well. Um, so, um, so that has kind of been our main message and our main thrust is that they should definitely get vaccinated. Um, continuing to the risk mitigation behaviors, you know, um, also is something that we have talked about as well. Um, however, those are somewhat limited. So that's why we've really talked a lot about um, vaccination. Um, the other thing too is with the resurgence of a lot of vaccine uh, preventable diseases, um, because of decreased adherence within the population, this is also another risk factor for individuals with uh, children with mitochondrial disease. Um, one of the main reasons we focus on children is because their immune system is distinctly different from that of adults, right? Their, their immune system is in the process of learning. Um, and part of that learning includes exposure to various infectious agents. Um, and so therefore, um, as I mentioned, vaccination is kind of the main thing that we focus on because that is a real major part of pediatric health care. Thank you very much. Thank you to all three of you, Peter, Zuela, and Amber, for these nice presentations. And I hope to see you at the pavilion next year. And I'll turn it back to Nicole for the conclusion. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are looking forward to a great 2024 um, a Clinical Research Pavilion. And to learn more about what to expect at the Mitochondrial Medicine 2024, we hope that you can join us for our next Bench the Bedside webinar series. That'll be on Monday, May 13th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, where we'll hear from the chairs of Mitomed 2024 to hear all about um, the sessions and everything going on at the conference this year. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your Monday.